Well, hello everyone and welcome to today's Help Systems webinar inside the Integrated File System. Coming to you from our Help Systems headquarters office here in Eden Prairie, uh, Tom Huntington's also located on the east coast of the US and then we've got Donnie from the UK, England and the UK. Thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, logistics for today's webinar, it'll last about 45 minutes. We are recording today's webinar and you will be receiving a link to that recording along with some additional collateral. So what you're about to partake in is a journey through the integrated file system or better known as the IFS. The IFS has enabled our IBMI to support web technologies, HTTP, open source technologies, PC file types, virtualized storage of integrated Intel server cards, Windows file shares, and other development environments such as Python, Ruby, Git, and it even allows IBMI partitions to host another virtual IBMI instance. So what's in your IFS? My name is Chuck Lisinski and I'm the Director of Technical Solutions here at Help Systems and it's a huge honor and privilege for me to share the stage with a couple of my IBMI heroes, Tom Huntington, Senior Vice President of Technical Solutions and IBM Champion, along with Donnie McCall, Director of EMEA Technical Services and all around good guy. Good morning, good afternoon, guys. Good morning, Chuck. Great to be here with you and sharing our expertise as we best can in the IFS area. So thank you all, all the customers that have joined us today. And hi for me too. And I, I also want to say, Thank you very much for everybody joining us, and it's a great privilege to be working with Tom and Chuck. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. All right, so uh, this agenda is loosely based on an online class that we have available on our website, along with some other IBMI educational opportunities, backup and recovery, also our well-known Ops 101 class. And today we're going to be doing some live demo of some um, uh, solutions that will help you out with the IFS as well. And we actually have quite a bit to cover here. Uh, so, Tom, uh, let's take it away. Yeah, let's, let's start out with the basics. Let's get flying, right? So the basics are, um, this is almost mind-blowing in my mind in that it has been, the IFS has been on the IBM I, I series and AS400 platform since V3R1 in 1994. That takes us back quite a ways. And, you know, back then, Donnie had blonde and curly hair. So believe it or not, that is quite a while ago. Um, but it does allow us to integrate many other applications like Unix and Windows into this IBMI platform. And I think as the server has gotten closer and closer to the Internet, so has the concerns around what is being put in the IFS. And, and it basically is a directory structure like you see in Linux and Windows. Some things behave a little differently. Uh, because you can define special rules around individual directories and how uh, items are placed in there and the rules for naming, those kinds of things. So we can have very much so a tree structure type approach to storing objects or files on the IBM I system. So you might be wondering, what are some of your applications that might be using the IFS out there? There's various uh, imaging packages that have been using this area for years for storing things like PDFs and spreadsheets out there. Uh, we've been hearing more about open source. Believe it or not, open source can run on IBM I. You know, things like Python and Git are technologies that are out there, different HTTP servers. IBM WebSphere has been using this, tech, this area for years. We also use it for PTFs and ISO images like Help Systems ships their software and stores components of it in the IFS. Of course, the PACE environment, which has been around for many years, and the ability to run Unix applications on IBM I, things like SAP or some of the things that you know JD Edwards Enterprise One has done. Of course, our client access executables are out there. TCP IP configurations, uh, HTTP servers like Tomcat are out there. <clears throat> So when you look at the file systems that can be supported, there's roughly about 10 different file systems. And depending upon the history and the point in time that you look at the IFS area, you might see seven file systems or 10, as we say today. There's the root. And the root is an interesting thing that people don't always realize is that there's a root directory system even above the fourth item we have out here, qsys.live, which is the traditional file system or the library file system in IBM I. 
But of course, we have the Unix environment. We have user defined where you can create your own rules. We have independent ASPs. If you're using technologies like PowerHA, we have the document library, the old QDLS, which I know there's many of you out there listening today that are still using what I would refer to as QDoc uh, on the system, something you should consider from a performance reason to, to get away from. The optical file system, again, old technology. The X-Series cards, some of you might still have X-Series cards in your um, Power 5 or Power 6 technology, but those things have been um, obsoleted over time. And then some of you might use IBM I to IBM I connections and sharing file systems through QFile Server 400. And then, of course, the network file systems. Okay, those are some of the things that we see out there. And of course, what can we do to get started with this area? Of course, we can look at it through using uh, commands on IBM I, or we can do the uh, access client solutions to access and see this information. We'll show you some of that today. This is where we can store what IBM refers to as stream files. What are stream files? They're you know, files that you would store on your, your Windows desktop, uh, a spreadsheet, a PDF, or even a Windows executable because the difference between Windows and IBM I programs are is IBM I programs are tamper-proof protected as they're stored in the OS OS infrastructure, but in the Windows world, the Unix world, the Linux world, they're not. You know, you have to have authority administered to that, and Chuck will show us some things on authority later on. So what can we contain? Videos, images, audio are all things that can be stored out in your IFS. IFS files are also called links, so you can have um, logical links to different parts of the IFS. Uh, symbolic links is what they technically are called. So um, really this area was added for a couple reasons. One, for performance, and two, to make it easier and more flexible to fit into your enterprise. All right, Tom, that brings us to our first polling question. We would like some feedback from our audience. The question is, how much experience do you have with the integrated file system? Maybe less than a year, you're new to the platform, two to five, six to nine years, over 10 years. And uh, how about no experience? Looks like we do have just uh, monitoring some of the responses right now. We do have a couple of uh, new folks on IBM I. We've got a small percentage there listing no experience and uh, less than one year, about 14% less than one year, 15% two to five. Like I said, there's a lot of new folks on IBM I, uh, well aware of that, and about half our audience, it looks like, has 10 or more years experience. And Chuck, this is really a, a good time to point out the IBM I marketplace study. If you are new to the platform, we've been doing this for five years, studying the market around IBM I, and that's a free downloadable piece. You can just Google IBM I marketplace study and you'll have some great information about this platform to share with your, your team. All right, and here's our, here's our results. Uh, you can see that in front of you right now. Like I said, about half the audience has a fair amount of experience on the platform, and, uh, and really about the other half has quite a bit less. About 25% has uh, you know, 5% or less, so that's, that's pretty interesting. Very good. Well, it's very interesting. Very interesting to see that we have 13% uh, with less than one year, or really 16% with less than one year or no experience with the IFS, which tells me they're, they're newer to the platform. That's good to see. All right, let's continue on. We'll turn it over to Donnie. Thanks for that. Yeah, it's very interesting to see so many people, let's say 16% who are new to the platform, really pleased we're getting newcomers. So that's really good. Tom's kindly explained what the IFS is. He said what you can use it for. So I think you can tell from the polling question, various levels of expertise in utilizing the integrated file system. So let's take a, just a short, a brief walk through some of the commands that you can use to navigate the IFS itself. Now, good news. Look, if you're familiar with Unix or more so DOS commands, you're good to go working with the IFS. You've already got some knowledge there. So you can see here on this slide, some of the commands that even if they're not immediately familiar, they are going to be immediately intuitive. So let me give you an example. MD, or make directory, does as it says in the tin, let you create a directory, or let's say a, a, a drawer in the filing cabinet, for example, 
where you can store the objects that you wish to use or perhaps store and secure for the future. If we just take another couple, we'll look at CD for change directory or current directory. If you just type in CD, it'll give you the name of the directory you're in. But you can also use it to navigate your way through the directory structure between various directories or look in different drawers of the filing cabinet, for example, to use what's stored in each of the directories. RD, powerful, dangerous, delete the directory and the contents when you no longer need them, or if you're being really good, when you're doing housekeeping. But come on, I wonder who actually remembers to do that, come on, be honest. Uh, you can also see there the copy and delete commands there as well for creating or deleting objects or subdirectories. Um, I will say that a huge advantage of the IFS is that just like the traditional IBMI authorities that you can use uh, to secure the traditional file system, you've got the same functionality here in the IFS. Really important, you can secure it as well, albeit with slightly different terminology. So how can you use the IFS and how can you do your own IFS? Because you've definitely got one, right? Work link, you can see it on the screen there. There's two ways, programmatically using um, APIs, but more commonly, day-to-day -day use using the work link command. Give it a go. After the webinar, stay to the end, please. After the end, try it. Type in the work link command. Don't make any changes, just have a look. Root directory. Now, when we're talking about directories, it's exactly the same as DOS, in that it's a hierarchical tree structure. The topmost directory, as we mentioned already, being the root directory, which is represented by a forward slash. Um, I've got to say, I've got a particular punch on. I really like DOS. Um, old DOS commands remind, reminds me of my warm and fuzzy feeling heading off to school in my neat little uniform, a little brown hat. Um, uh, I digress. Um, I like DOS anyway. So CD space and a forward slash will take you to the topmost directory instantly, regardless of where you are in the IFS directory structure. You can see slash Donny and slash Donny. So the Unix rules apply, um, but they're different. <laughs> so as we mentioned, it, it's familiar but different. The Unix rules, upper and lowercase characters, are maintained, but importantly, unlike Unix, they don't, they don't mean different things. So slash on all capitals, slash on lowercase, the same thing. Each of the past names, it can make it meaningful, up to 255 characters, but it can make it quite wieldy, but can be quite useful. You can have a full concatenated past name, it can be huge. Fun fact, full past name can be as much as 16 million plus bytes in size. I've never seen anything close to it. Uh, with all the files that have been addressed, we'll branch off the route. Next slide, please. Check. Okay, now I mentioned you can use work link. So display the route. You can either type in work link, I'll show you that in the next slide, and you'll see the whole structure, or you can do work link at forward slash, takes you right to the route, and you can see the, this tree the tree structure that I mentioned. You'll notice here, again, something familiar. The directories are right out of the Unix environment. Some were set file system, some were created by IBM, some for other purposes. Some are vendor directories, right? So if you look at help systems, this is directly off the root directory. Help systems is one that I've created myself. You can even see files at this level as well. Now, I'm just I'm going to pick three of the, the directories out, the folders out. Slash bin isn't a trash can, as people commonly think. It's a directory that stores essential operating system executables, ready to run files, you run when they're called. The ETC folder, that contains really important system configuration and admin files. You're going to find things like user list, group list, what you should run at startup, configuration for server apps such as mail servers, web servers, FTP servers. And the USR folder, the user folder, that contains programs and data files. So it's similar to, uh, let's say, program files on Windows. And um, just one thing to appreciate, these folders are guidelines. So if they're familiar and they're similar, there's different flavors and different standards. So the systems might have the same uh, folder name or object name, but it might do something slightly different. Now, the good news, next slide please check. Now, this is really good news as well. Using IBMI, they give you a great tool to access client solutions. Most of us know it for using terminal emulation. The great thing is, using IBMI access client solutions, you're gonna get a modern, easy to navigate view of your IFS just as if you're using a Windows PC server. Personally, I prefer this view, but the great news is ACS is an as well as, not an instead of. So you can use this as well as the green screen if that's what you prefer. Thanks, Joe. Very good, thank you, Donnie. 
So uh, Donnie introduced you now to the root structure of the integrated file system. And keep in mind, the integrated file system, when we talk about that, we're talking about storage. So what is stored in the IFS? We know that there's a root structure and there are multiple structures off of the root. And because the IFS contains all of our storage, one of those structures off the root directory is our traditional library structure, and it's contained in a subdirectory off of the root called qsys.lib. Now, as Tom mentioned, each one of these file structures underneath the root has different rules associated with it. And we all know that the rules that are associated with the library structure are all uppercase. All right, so that's one of the rules that you'll see in this particular structure. And then when you're working in this library structure, there's a particular naming convention for the objects that are stored there. We're all familiar with the 10 character names. And then there's also a suffix uh, associated with the objects that determine what the object types are. That's one of the things that we love about the library structure. Every object there has a particular type. Here we're going to use option five inside a qsys.lib. We're going to drill down. You can see we've got in our help systems library, helpsys.lib, we've got a couple of objects. In this case, they're physical files, and they have the suffix of dot file. So you can see that there's a specific naming convention associated with this, this structure under the root. Now let's take a look at another file system under the root, QDLS. As Tom mentioned, this is an older file structure. You can see something listed here called Office Vision. Office Vision is long dead, um, went out a long time ago. And the point that I we're making by bringing up QDLS is that yes, there are rules associated with it. Uh, eight characters on the left of the uh, decimal point and three on the right, and, or on a, uh, the period. and. Uh, uh, the point of this is that oftentimes we're finding our customers still using this file system. However, it doesn't perform real well, and we really want you to get out of this file system. So if you are still using it, it's time to move away. Just create a directory off the root. If you're going to be storing, for instance, PDF-type documents, we absolutely recommend going in that direction. Okay. And then secure it, right, Chuck? Secure and then lock it down, you bet. Um, so the next file system we're going to mention is a QOpenSys. This is the Unix file system, and we'll take a look at this. You'll see this represented in our uh, robot space demo here that we're going to do in a second. Specific naming convention associated with QOpenSys is that it abides by both upper and lower case naming. So whereas um, um, the root directory is not case sensitive. I'm, I'm sorry, the QOpenSys is case sensitive. QOpenSys, you can see we've got our um, uh, camel case, lower case, upper case. So that would be root directory. And in this case, the, the data inside of QOpenSys is case sensitive. So the directory name itself is not case sensitive. All right, because it's a directory off of the root, it's the contents of the QOpenSys directory that is case sensitive. So you can see here, we are using the work link command. We've navigated inside of QOpenSys. You can see the directory name is all lowercase, and uh, we've got several subdirectories as well as stream files in there. We've got two stream files that are listed as address. One is uppercase, one is lowercase. So those are two individual files. And that's because their naming convention is uppercase versus lowercase. And as Donnie mentioned, you can also have very large directory names, up to 255 characters. F22 with your cursor on that particular line will give you the entire directory name. The green screen shows you only a portion of it. F22 will expand that out and give you the entire directory name. All right, so that's the Unix file structure, case sensitive for the contents of that particular directory. All right, another file system that's located off of the root, QFileServe 400, a very unique file system. It gives you the ability to see directory information for another partition 
by navigating into a local subdirectory. All right, it does require that the queue server subsystem be active. It does use the requesting user's profile and password to authenticate to that target system. And the connection itself must be recreated upon IPL. So if you do IPL your system, this particular connection is disabled and removed. So let's take a look at Donnie's make directory command. So if you make a directory inside of the qfileserve.400 with a uh, with the th the target system name defined as a subdirectory that will create a subdirectory in that qfileserve400 and as you can see at the top we have navigated now into that robot u subdirectory and we can now actually see the root directory of another IBM I partition, a remote partition. So as mentioned, this has to be reestablished when you IPL, the user doing the requesting, those credentials are checked and compared on the target system. Uh, Tom mentioned something called a user-defined file system. User-defined, uh, the commands are listed here for the user-defined file system. And uh, this is a really good example of um, how we used this portion of the integrated file system to support, for instance, storage used by um, an IBM I hosting I or storage used by the infamous um, uh, integrated X series cards or Intel cards. They provided storage using this user defined storage space for those um, either virtual IBM I hosting I or if you were, if you did have one of the Intel cards inserted into your Power 5 or Power 6 system. All right, define your own file system, so to speak. Okay, so we've got a lot of data out there and a lot of people struggle with oftentimes what they call the black hole of the integrated file system. So uh, we've developed and have been developing technology to help you manage your storage, whether it's library storage or the other portion of the integrated file system and navigate that and determine what's growing out there and keep it nice and clean and tidy. And the technology is called Robot Space, does real-time monitoring as well as analysis of growth in the integrated file system and gives you visibility into your integrated file system. So let's take a, let's take a quick look at Robot Space. All right, so the Robot Space tool is a tool that runs native on your IBM I and to access the data that is being collected by Robot Space, you use our Robot Space GUI Explorer. And the purpose behind Robot Space is to do uh, several things. First of all, it does real time monitoring of your ASPs, whether they're the SysBase storage or an independent ASP. All right. And we also have something called storage audits. Storage audits will go out to your storage and they will report on areas that need to be cleaned up or that can be cleaned up. And we will also do automatic cleanup. All right, so we can age IFS objects. So we can take a look at a directory. We can look at when those objects were either created or last used. And we can actually remove them from the directory based on criteria that you tell us you want to purge that data in the integrated file system. So here I've identified a couple of subdirectories and files, in this case, stream files in those subdirectories, and I want to purge those after 90 days. All right, so now you've got a tool that can actually clean up the integrated file system, unused save files, unused journal receivers, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so that's some automatic cleanup that can happen inside of robot space. And then we've got our storage collections. Storage collections run typically once a day and they report on what you have stored in your library structure in your integrated file system. All right, so my latest collection ran on February 3rd. I could, for instance, see the largest libraries on my system, the objects in the libraries, and likewise, I can navigate into the integrated file system. 
So right now we're pulling that data into the graphical interface and it's saying, well, here's the largest libraries, or excuse me, the largest directories we have on the system. All right, Tom mentioned image catalogs and updating products through image catalogs. So you can see here we do have, for instance, a, a image catalog that was created. And if we wanna look back in time, all right, so it looks like uh, over the past year, I've got data that goes back to April of 2018. Well, that looks like that directory is pretty stable. Uh, let's take a look at another one, size history. Uh, that one looks pretty stable too. So I really can't tell just by looking at individual directories how much they've grown unless I do a comparison. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna, I'm gonna take two of my storage collections and I'm gonna say, let's compare IFS directories. All right, so what this is going to do now is it's gonna do a side-by-side -side comparison of the directories that exist in these two collections that were done a month apart, and it's gonna tell us what directories have changed the most. So if suddenly you've lost storage on your system, this should be able to help you determine what's changed. So here in the QIBM directory, in this subdirectory, all these subdirectories were pretty much non-existent and they've grown quite a bit. Uh, over the past year. You can see here's where we've been over the past year and all of a sudden we had a spike here just in the last month. All right, easy to identify where you might be losing storage. All right, and with that, let's talk about monitoring the IFS. Thanks, Jack. So we've spoken about um, a, a number of the commands that you can use on the ISS and how you can navigate it. Let's have a little closer look at some of the commands you can use to actually monitor and control the ISS as well. So we touched on some of the directory commands, the make directory and remove directory. Uh, there's also link commands and object commands, similar again to Unix or DOS, so quite familiar. Uh, we've got copy commands, we can copy objects from libraries to directories and from directories to libraries as well. Um, I also mentioned that the ISS is configurable and it's also securable. Now, an example of the controls you can have is the ability to, I like this, the ability to check in and check out objects again from the ISS. So, for example, I could check a file out from a directory, maybe the help systems directory created. While I've got that file checked out, everybody can still use it and view it, but they can't change it apart from myself. Nobody can update it until I check it back in again. It's just another area of, of the, just proves the real power of functionality you've got in the ISS. Um, obviously, you need to back up and restore these files and directories as well. So we've got save and restore commands or sat and rust commands, as we refer to uh, when we talk about the IFS. And just got fun fact number two. Now, we've covered between the three of us so far, we still want to go, lots of commands. How are you going to remember them all? Well, we said that work link's great to view the IFS. Here's the next one to make a note of, go file sys. There's a menu system, go file sys from the green screen. It brings up all you need to use, all you need to do to manage the IFS, a menu-based system, access to directory, object, and security command. And that's a really easy way to do it. Next slide, please, Jack. Thank you. Okay, so name the rules for, you look at uh, make directory, correct directory, remove directory. Name the rules for the directory name depends on one of the 10 file systems that um, Tom covered earlier. And it also says the directory has been created into. So the example we've got here, it's basically been created, we've created a checker home directory, and we did it in the root of the home directory. Now you can see from this green screen command, the authorities can also be set, as we mentioned, for directories and or objects. And if you take the, uh, the slash IMDR DIR default authority, that means you're going to inherit the authority from the directory above it, in this case, the root file. And you can order access as well. So very, very powerful, similar to green screen IBMI as well. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, navigation is quite easy too. So using the church current directory, you can specify directory and path. You can make it a current directory before you run a command. Church D and CD would let you do the same thing as well. Uh, also, I mentioned you can uh, manage your ISS programmatically. You can do the, you can use the retrieve current directory command programmatically, which will allow you to retrieve the current directory you're in and perform an action or a decision based on the directory that you're in as well. Looking at the link command, we keep mentioning this work link. 
the work link command is without doubt the most commonly used command. Now you should just enter it and press enter. You can prompt it up as well. Uh, there are other, man, other commands you can use. And if you see here, you, you can, for example, using work link, you can view the ISS, you can then edit, you can copy, you can remove, you can display attributes, and you can navigate to uh, a, a different uh, level within the ISS as well. Looking at the copy command, now I mentioned you can copy commands, you can copy directories, you can even copy, really powerful, you can copy entire directories and subdirectories and objects as well. Really neat. And there's some really powerful copy commands as well. You can copy through disparate systems. So um, we mentioned stream files. So copy to stream file will allow you to copy a DB2 database file, for example, or a save file to a stream file. Copy from does the same in reverse. And it's really clever because it will handle data conversion for you. It's seamless. And I'll show you that in a moment. There's also the copy to imp file, copy to import file, where you can copy data from an externally described file to an import file to import into a spreadsheet, for example, into, into Excel. A lot you can do there. And then if we just take a look at the copy to stream file, so if you just look here where we prompted it up, I want to highlight a few areas here. This example, we're copying to a stream file. This is where we're copying from a traditional DB2 database file into a stream file. In this case, we're copying it to a text file, to seven text on the IFS. But you can see what I mentioned previously, how the conversion is handled automatically. Um, also, if you note know the database file CCSS ID, the character set identification, you can take that from the DB2 file and seamlessly and automatically convert it to, for example, ASCII or PC ASCII. So hopefully you can appreciate this sort of gold mine the IFS is very, very powerful indeed. Okay, thanks, Donnie. Well, with that, we talked to, about some monitoring commands. What we'd like to do is show you some technology that we have in our robot product line called Robot Monitor that can help you monitor those applications running and using the integrated file system. And it's pretty cool technology. All right, so let's bring that up. All right, so here's Robot Monitor, and we got a couple ways we can look at data. So first of all, Robot Monitor is a monitoring technology that runs native on IBM I and AIX, and it supports AIX so that we can also monitor those VIOS micro partitions that are assisting you with your virtualized IBM I world. So this technology is running live every 30 seconds going out and monitoring your various IBM I partitions. This particular dashboard is called production because I have three partitions that I consider to be my production partitions. And you can see through the color coding, we've got some uh, issues going on here. I've got some subsystems that aren't active. Those sub, one of those subsystems could easily be supporting one of your applications that are also supporting maybe a website or uh, some other technology that is using the integrated file system. All right. And if we do have some kind of a performance spike, we can simply drill down into that data and drill down into the performance spike and potentially maybe it could be something that you're doing uh, or something that's happening maybe in WebSphere, for instance. Okay, so we can drill down into that data and work with the job and so forth. But I'm gonna take a look at just one particular system here. It's called Wisdom. All right, so I'm collecting a, quite a few metrics associated with the performance of my applications that are running there and the system in general. Currently, we're using 83% DASD, 51% CPU utilization. Uh, my uh, jobs out there on the system that are using JDBC, which certainly could be web applications. Here we can see the CPU being consumed by those. But I also wanted to put some specific monitoring around uh, some HTTP server applications that are running out there. So I'm just monitoring some of our uh, web services that we have out there running in QHTTP SVR subsystem. We've got our SQL web interface, web docs. Uh, those jobs are active. Okay, that all looks good. Uh, I've got 12 jobs associated with SQL web interface. So what we can do is we can put m monitoring and thresholds around that. So if you need a certain number of jobs running in a subsystem, maybe by a particular name, 
we can put notification around that if, for instance, we don't have the correct number or we have too many. And likewise, I've also put some CPU monitoring around the HTTP server job. You can see right our HTTP server subsystem currently we're not using much at all, but we can also put historical reporting around this quite easily. All right. So we're, this is what's happened in the last 30 seconds, but we can also drill down and show you summary information. All right, so what's this? what have these metrics been doing over the past hour, the last day, the last week, the last month, or the last year? Okay, so some additional monitoring technology that we have that can certainly assist you with the integrated file system and those applications running. All right, let's talk about replication in the IFS. Tom. Well, thank you, Chuck. Uh, let's uh, do that. Let's go in and talk about backups and the IFS because obviously that's important too. If we're storing data out there, we need to make sure that we're uh, also saving it. Um, you know, it's no secret. Uh, there's a big turnout here today. So more and more of you are concerned about the IFS, but then we have to get back to is Are we backing this up? Are we replicating it? And that's what this part of the session is about. And with IFS, there's the SAV command for backing up these directories and RST for restoring the directories. Now, these would not be used against your library structures. You still want to use your save live, save change objects, save sys, et cetera. You should also know that if you're doing save 21 on the system, there isn't a, a part of the process of that is backing up your IFS. So if you're doing that at least once a year, you're at least getting once a year a backup of this area. Um, but that might not be enough, especially if we're storing critical documents out there, et cetera, which many of you are doing. So the thing you need to know as you get into using the SAV or the RST command, I now have to address the, the device or the save file that I'm using by adding in the prefixes and addressing qsys.live where all your configuration objects are stored, like we see here with the backslashes. So anyways, this is uh, very important to specify that. <clears throat> and then as we roll through this command, some other things to think about with SAV is that we should be, able, if we're gonna back up everything in the IFS, we should exclude some directories like qsys.live and qdls, and notice there's omit commands. We also have include commands, and there's another parameter, uh, but just due to time and how much information we have today, um, very important, as you know, when you save an object um, using save live commands, um, it updates the history about that object. There's a history parameter here, too, that you need to be concerned about, okay? So SAV, RST, deal with backing up and restoring the IFS area. Now, another aspect of this, can I replicate this area? And the answer is yes, you do have start journal and end journal commands to journal your IFS directories and the objects with them. You still got to use the create journal receiver and create journal to do this and the remote journal commands if you're going to use it with high availability. Use the wildcards to start your journaling so it automatically is doing everything that's in there. And well, HA software like Robot HA makes it easy to replicate IFS. And I'm going to show you a little demo of that. And as we talk about that product, um, Robot HA does run on IBM I, does use remote journaling and local journaling to replicate libraries, but it also works real time with IFS directories. I'm not sure that a lot of customers realize that as you add objects into the um, IFS, they can be replicated real time through local and remote journaling. So I'm gonna do a little live demo. As soon as Chuck makes me presenter, I will do that for you. Okay, awesome. I'm gonna show my screen as best we can. Um, so we have, uh, actually, let me do one more thing here. We'll do share my screen and so you don't see all my ugly icons in the background. There we go. All right, so we have a source system wisdom and a target system academy here. I'm going to get into my robot HA software by just doing RBO. Um, through the green screen access and option 25 for robot HA. And our main option here is the synchronization attributes panel. This basically shows me everything 
that I'm replicating. I have a directory. I have my own home directory that's being replicated. If I wanted to add a new directory to here, I can press F6. It'll give me a list. I choose IFS. I type in my directory I want to replicate, my target system, and how often I want to cycle through. And we will automatically create your local and remote journals for you. Um, I've already got one set up already, so let's turn our direction to our directory Tom H. If I press F21 from here, I should get our handy dandy command line up, hopefully. Here. Oh. Oh, we do have it. Okay, work link. Um, and then if I type option five here over on my target system, I can see my directory system over here. Chuck, I may have locked up on my end. Am I still here? You, it looks like your uh, your remote display has maybe. There, it's uh, oh, there catching, up, catching up slowly. Okay. Yeah, there we go. I think somebody from the home office was calling me while I'm doing all these wonderful demos. <laughs> so, so here's my target directory over on Academy, and I'm opening that up, and we'll see we have objects in it. Over on my source system, I'm going to do the work link command and type in uh, home, and we'll bring up that same directory um, and show you that the two match, right? We'll see... Tom H, Tom H. Now, if I want it, if I remove something from my source system, like notice I have order, I have two of these. I'm going to remove one from here. Now I'm down to just one. And even a removal of a document is automatically replicated. Now, if I come back to my source system, and I, I'm going to just copy this object here that starts with RC, and just so there's nothing up my sleeve, and Donnie, sometimes we do tell the truth here, um, I'm going to copy this over. <laughs> you don't trust us Americans, do you? No, I'm just kidding. We have a good relationship. And now if I press F5 on my target, notice how that object just came through. So real-time monitoring with the IFS, I'm sorry, real-time replication with the IFS can be achieved on IBM I, but it either takes you writing something that used local and remote journaling yourself, or there are packages like Robot HA that does this. The other thing, too, is keep in mind, if you use hardware replication, you can put all this information into uh, an IASP. You can put your directories out there, and you can have them replicated through PowerHA, too. So back to you, Chuck. Very good. Thank you, Tom. Let me take back control. Absolutely. All right, let's talk about securing the integrated file system. You just saw Tom manipulating a bunch of stream files in the integrated file system, so obviously security is important. Certainly we don't want people out there deleting files and uh, potentially copying or downloading files that they should not have authority to, and that's a real issue out there in the world, of course. So when we think about IFS directory type authority, we want to we want to almost think of it in terms of library authority. I mean, we know that we can put objects in a library and we can secure the library. You should think about that too in terms of the integrated file system. If you have, for instance, a directory full of confidential PDF type documents. Certainly you want to put those documents in there and secure that directory. The cool thing about the integrated file system, as Donnie mentioned a little bit earlier, is that it actually uses multiple types of authority. So it uses both IBM I type authority, Unix type authority, as well as that PC type permissions that you would see if you were working in the Windows world. All right, so what sort of special authority do you need on the, your user profile to manipulate this? You do need the SEC admin special authority to be able to manipulate permissions or privileges as we sometimes refer to working with these types of authorities. Now these commands should look somewhat familiar if you're used to working with IBM I library type authorities, but the OBJ in the middle of the uh, command is not is not there because we're working with stream files. So we're gonna work with the display authority, work authority, change authority, and then ch change owner commands rather than for instance, change object owner. So these are specific to the integrated file system. 
Also, you can simply navigate into the security that's associated with a stream file or a directory using the option nine, work with authority or work authority option next to a directory or stream file when you're in your work with object links command. So here, for instance, we're taking option nine next to the help systems directory, and we've, uh, we're looking at those users or one user that has some rights to this directory, C. Lazinski has read and execute authority. So I can see objects in there and I can execute processes over the data that's in that directory. So these would be for private authorities and then default public authorities. Well, here's a good example. This should be look familiar if you're used to the library world. We're simply excluding public out of that particular directory. So they would have to have some specific either private authority through a group profile or an individual profile. Okay, so a little bit to analyzing how your IFS is secured. We have kind of a leg up for you. We call it the security scan. It's a free service. It is a, a Windows a utility that you would download to your Windows desktop and then run against IBM I and it collects various security related information from your IBM I including IFS related security. And the result is it gives you a report card of the information that it's collected. And then you also receive a free hour or so of consulting from one of our security experts that helps you digest the results of this IBM I security scan. We also have it available for AIX and a couple of flavors of Linux. Uh, if you'd like to take advantage of that, you will have the opportunity to opt in. Um, uh, through some follow-up, through a follow-up email, as well as a survey question that we're going to have here at the end of the presentation. Also, from a security standpoint, we have our native antivirus tool for the integrated file system called the PowerTech Antivirus for IBM I. Scans those stream files that are being added or opened in the integrated file system so you can make sure that your IFS is nice and clean. The IFS or the AS400, IBM I, and iSeries have always been known as a very secure environment. Unfortunately, the integrated file system is a good carrier of viruses. And now that we've got so much code out there that we actually execute out of the integrated file system, you certainly wouldn't want something like a crypto lock virus getting a hold of that and potentially disabling your end user applications. All right, so we've got one more question for you. How would you like us to follow up? All right, so I'm gonna launch that polling question. One of the options in the polling question is we'd like to schedule a tech update for me and my team. And the tech update is a discussion where we talk about the products that you currently own from Help Systems, what the roadmap is for those products. We like to learn what your roadmap is, and that helps us provide better service to you. And certainly we have a lot more to offer uh, around our various solutions, both IBM I and non IBM I. So take a second to answer that question. And while you're answering that, we do have a few follow-up questions. And uh, one of them is, um, well, and I'll, I'll throw this out to either Tom or Donnie, do I really need to worry about viruses on IBM I? Um, I, think, I think there's some Josh, surprise. Yeah. yeah, they're probably, you know, and we do hear that and customers are like, well, no, IBM says IBM I is secure and you don't have to worry about viruses. What they're what they're referring to is you don't have to worry about them in the operating system or the library area, but you do have to worry about them being stored out in the IFS. And you know, one of the things you talked about was security just lately, and you were talking about you know revoking public. You have to watch out the root directory on IBM I. We've had customers have that open up to the public, and somebody executed ransomware from a Windows server, and it locked them out of their system. So. Be careful with that also. Donnie, any other thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree with Tom totally, and it, it's really quite timely. Literally, just within the last two weeks, with one of our clients, they were complaining that the system was slow. That was all they were saying, the system was slow. They tried everything, they got in touch us, said, we know it's not your problem to solve, but can you help us? We literally ran a free virus scan, and we found 122 viruses on the ISS that they didn't know they got. Uh, they're, they're kind of blase. One comment was made, well, you know, they're on the ISS, why do I care? 
once they hit a Windows PC, the fire scan on there will clean them. I said, how do you think they got in there in the first place? It came from a Windows PC. <laughs> so um, it's, it's essential, absolutely. Uh, so I'd just like to make a point, too, that any of the products that you saw today are certainly available for a 30-day trial, a robot monitor, robot space, robot HA. So certainly you could take advantage of that. A uh, question about robot space. Uh, um, participant is asking, well, we run the retrieve disk info for the IFS. Why is robot space better? Anybody want to take that? Well, I can jump in on that. Uh, you saw the compare. You can't compare IFS collection to collection using the retrieve disk info command, plus the multitude of steps you got to do to do it. Um, robot space, it's there, it's automated. And then there's also the aging of the IFS that does not done either, uh, which is something that we need to do. We run into more and more customers who say, my backups are taking so long, my replication's getting behind. It's because they're not cleaning up this area. So we thank you for taking that polling question. You know, we do have a summary slide, Chuck, so we should pop through that. Um, you know, we've gone through a lot of information today, you know, manipulating the IFS, monitoring, backing it up, journaling, and security, all things that need to be done, all things that we need to pay attention to, because this has become a more important area as the server has gotten closer and closer to the Internet. Um, and just, uh, you know, if we talk about products, um, we certainly have the robot solution, we have the health sand solution um, to help you out with monitoring and automation in this area. Um, we have the ability, just in robot schedule, we have the ability to monitor files being created in the IFS and launching batch jobs. And of course, we can monitor IFS air logs and robot console, replicate with HA, and help you monitor your performance in uh, many different ways with Performance Navigator or Robot Monitor. And Help Systems, our portfolio has grown. We've done several acquisitions. Matter of fact, we just did an acquisition yesterday. We acquired a security company, not on IBMI, but off of IBMI, so we'll continue to do that. Um, but we have a lot to offer in security on IBMI, dealing with the IFS, managing files coming in, encrypting data in and out, antivirus. And then from an automation standpoint, we can help age and monitor and schedule things in and out of the IFS. We also have document management. Um, we can certainly uh, store documents out there. Uh, we can even encrypt data being stored in IFS objects inside of IBMI with our uh, PowerTech encryption for IBMI. So a lot going on at Help Systems and even BI. So we'd love to help you out with better reporting around what's happening in your database on IBMI. All right. And with that, yeah, and with that, Tom, we'd like to thank all of our participants today for sticking with us and uh, participating in our polling questions. Really appreciate your time. If you're a Help Systems customer, we really appreciate your business. And if you're not, we'd like to see you uh, in one of our uh, solutions. I think that would be a, a great way to go for you. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Otherwise, everybody have a great day. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yeah, Chuck, I was going to add in, too, just a little bit on security that um, people do. Uh, there is a webinar by Carol Woodbury out on our website that talks about IFS security, and I think Robin Tatum, too. Those are two things that are great to look at. Um, we have a few more questions that have come in, but I know we promised we'd wrap up in 45 minutes, and we've gone over, so we probably got to get rolling, and we'll, we'll get back to you, uh, Leonard and Stefan, I think it is, uh, that just came in. All right. Yep, we will do that. Thanks, everybody.